Uh, welcome. Welcome, everybody. We're going to get started, so we have enough time to um, hear from our speakers and have a robust q and A. I'm Elizabeth Donahue. I'm the Associate Dean for Public and External Affairs here at the Wilson School. And uh, for those who haven't been to one of our public affairs talks, welcome. And for the many familiar faces I see in the audience, welcome back. I hope you all had a good summer. We're glad that uh, we're resuming our public affairs programming for the year. Um, today's talk is titled, Americans Under Attack, Libya, Egypt, Yemen, and American-Muslim Relations. This is one of our up-to-the-minute events, as those who have come to our events before know when things happen in the news, we do try to respond. Um, and so we pulled this together last week, and we're very lucky that we have on our faculty two experts who were ready to just jump in and do this with us. Um, we have Ambassador Daniel Kurtzer. He was the former U.S. Ambassador to Egypt and Israel, and at different times. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he is the S. Daniel Abraham Professor in Middle East Policy Studies, as well as a lecturer here at the Wilson School. And we have Ambassador Barbara Bodine, who is the former U.S. Ambassador to Yemen, and is also a lecturer here, as well as the director of our Scholars in the Nation Service Initiative. So again, we have, it's amazing that we, have, we are able to pull from our faculty so quickly on these really important issues. And just to round out before we start today's talk, we have a lot of handouts for you. Um, we've decided to join the 21st century, so we're trying to have a Facebook presence and um, have done pretty well with our Facebook page, but it would be great if you all went and liked us. So um, we have all of our social media information on a flyer up here, as well as a taste of some of the upcoming events. If you're not part of our listserv, our e-newsletter that goes out once a week with all our events, please do sign up. It's the best way to find out what's going on here, and it's right on our website. So thank you, and thank you for being here. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, Barbara and I had about uh, 30 seconds to coordinate our presentation, so uh, I hope it doesn't look that way. Uh, what I want to do is pose uh, maybe five questions. Uh, and I, I organized the talk this way because, in fact, if anyone presumes to know the answers to the questions I pose, they should be up here. <laughs> We're at a moment of uh, great uncertainty uh, in a region which has always been difficult to understand, but even more so in the last uh, 20 months, since what we thought we knew about the Middle East had changed so dramatically with the onset of the Arab uprisings, uh, misnomered the Arab Spring. Uh, the first question, of course, is uh, a combination of two questions. What happened over the last week and why? Uh, nothing that I say should be taken as uh, either an excuse for those who perpetrated the violence, or in any way expressing understanding for it. It was horrible, it was horrific, it was terroristic, and there is no excusing it. But it happens against the backdrop of a certain way of thinking which we as Americans need to understand. What happened in Libya, for example, in Benghazi, is still not fully understood. The government of Libya has said that uh, this was a a pre-planned attack by uh, militants, perhaps Al-Qaeda. Uh, they have rounded up, uh, at least at last count, about 50 alleged perpetrators. The State Department and the U.S. government, however, have been far more circumspect in uh, making such a judgment. Uh, and for the U.S. government, until we have more evidence uh, going back through intelligence and combing through whatever information we had, the American government is not ready to pronounce itself on the question of whether this was a pre-planned attack. For those of us watching from the outside, it certainly looked pre-planned, because as opposed to the demonstrations that uh, evolved into violence elsewhere in the region and elsewhere in the uh, Islamic world, in Benghazi, uh, those who attacked our consulate came with heavy weapons. So at least some of those involved in the attack in Benghazi uh, knew what they were doing before they came. It's unclear, however, whether or not the larger crowds that were involved there or elsewhere were part of some pre-planned, uh, organized uh, activity. Uh, the why, as part of this qu first question, the why this happened, 
Uh, well, there's no excuse for it. It's uh, simply an act of terror against the United States. We happen to present in the Arab world and have presented for many years an extremely convenient target for all kinds of alleged uh, misdeeds and alleged problems. Uh, most of them have to do with our policy vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East peace process, vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Some of it in recent years has to do with the allegation that we only fight wars against Muslims. You've heard all of this. So the why uh, takes place against the backdrop of long-standing uh, Arab and Muslim complaints about the United States. And as we've seen in other contexts, for example, the Danish cartoons or the fatwa against Salman Rushdie, there is the ability within certain quarters of the Islamic world to generate a tremendous amount of emotion when the honor of the prophet or the religion of Islam is uh, presumed to be dishonored. And so whatever the immediate cause was of what happened in Benghazi and elsewhere, the fact is that it is not in some sense unusual to see this kind of emotional uh, cascade uh, develop in which uh, the masses get riled up when they feel that their religion has been uh, dishonored. The uh, second question is whether or not, in fact, the, what we've seen over the past 20 months, the so-called uh, uh, Arab Spring or Arab uprisings, have in fact become uh, an Islamic Spring. Uh, and in fact, if you look around at the uh, very few places where there has been a substantive change, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, uh, not really anywhere else in, in uh, uh, what we would call even possibly positive terms, uh, the role of Islamists has grown quite large since these uprisings. And, you know, in previous sessions here, we discussed some of the reasons why. The fact is that for many years, these Islamic groups were forced underground. Uh, they were able, therefore, uh, as underground groups, to organize in a way that uh, the groups that were playing the game of politics above ground were not able to organize. And so when the Arab uprisings or upheavals took place, those groups that were best organized uh, were able to uh, triumph at least immediately. We saw in the Egyptian election, for example, in the parliamentary elections that have now been overturned by the Egyptian uh, Supreme Constitutional Court, 75% uh, of the seats in parliament were won by Islamists, 50% by those associated with the party that is based on the Muslim Brotherhood and about 25% of the Salafists. Now, it's unclear, even with those election results, that those numbers represent the population distribution or the affi affinity distribution of uh, people within uh, Egyptian society or elsewhere. We know that Egypt, for example, is a highly religious country, but it's not clear that over time uh, an Islamist political orientation would actually predominate. But at least in this first election, in the first manifestation of the will of people uh, in a, a relatively free and fair election, uh, the Islamists were far better organized. I remember in one of our sessions, maybe a year ago or so, uh, right after the elections, a year and change ago, we talked about how well organized. It seemed like Chicago had in the old days of uh, Mayor Daley, the Islamists uh, organizing buses and having coffee set up outside of polling places and essentially making it easy for people to vote. So on the second question of whether the Arab Spring has in fact become an Islamist Spring, I think it's an open question. And at least for the time being, the Islamists have been far better uh, prepared and far better positioned to take advantage of the opening that uh, the Arab uprisings have uh, given to them to play out their politics in an environment that is not uh, determined by the course of power of the state. Now the question is, does this continue over time? Uh, right now there is controversy in Egypt quite apart from the demonstrations against the American embassy about a proposal that uh, President Mohamed Morsi is considering to reinstate parts of the emergency law. Uh, for those who are not familiar with that, in 1981 after the assassination of Anwar Sadat, 
emergency law was uh, pronounced in Egypt, which allowed the government essentially to do anything it wanted to anyone at any time. And this was one of the main complaints of those who uh, took part in the uprising that overthrew Mubarak, that these emergency laws gave the government a legal basis in which to act in a uh, very terrible manner. Uh, one of the first things that the new parliament did, of course, was to overturn uh, or rescind the emergency laws. The uh, Supreme Council of the Armed Forces was a little slower in ratifying that, but in fact, the emergency laws were ultimately overturned. Today, President Morsi is considering whether or not to reinstate some of those emergency laws in order to ensure the ability of the government to uh, do law and order, which is a quite extraordinary event, or would be an extraordinary event were it to take place. So this whole question of the character, the direction of the uh, Arab Spring or Arab uprisings, the Islamic awakening is still a very uh, open question and one which I don't think the events of the last uh, two weeks uh, gives us uh, some additional evidence to understand. Third, uh, with respect to uh, Egypt in particular, and I know uh, Ambassador Bodine will focus a little bit more on, on Yemen, uh, what is the status of change? Um, again, without making excuses for what happened, uh, think back to revolutions in other countries. Uh, they don't happen overnight. The immediacy of a change in uh, the top, what we called here about a year ago, the decapitation of the Mubarak regime, uh, takes a long time to translate into what might be called a subsequent revolutionary regime. And so after 20 months, it would be unfair to judge the Egyptian revolution on the basis of whether it has succeeded or failed. In some respects, it is on a track which suggests that there may in fact be the growth of a something of a democratic culture. Uh, there are tremendous debates within that society. Uh, factions which had not been organized previously in elections just in the past week have started to come together. And we may see the beginning of two or three larger political parties. The Freedom and Justice Party associated with the Muslim Brotherhood, the Anur Party associated with the Salafists, and perhaps a centrist and a leftist party which would be an amalgamation of those forces of the left and center which had presented themselves as individual parties in the last election, but which therefore, um, as a result of their not being organized well, they didn't do well. Uh, and now they're starting to come together and may, we may be seeing a, a regularization of politics in a society which uh, is still practicing uh, uh, what politics really are. So the status of change in these societies is really still a work in progress, and one that I think it would be far too early to draw uh, final uh, judgments. Um, uh, finally, I would suggest, uh, as I think it's the fourth question, I told you yeah, five, but four. yeah, I know, if you're keeping track, I'm, I'm only gonna do four. Okay. Um, the, the question on all of our minds, of course, is well, what next? Uh, over the past 24 hours, there's been some diminution in the level of violence against our diplomatic establishments in the Middle East. Some of that violence has now spread to uh, Muslim countries elsewhere, uh, Indonesia and so forth. Um, is this likely to recur? And the answer is yes, it is likely to recur. Uh, the uh, same um, typology of violence which we've seen played out on the ground over the past 10 days will happen time and again when the prophet's honor or religious honor is uh, cited by inciters as a reason for people to go to the street. Uh, and uh, the fact is, as I mentioned earlier, the American embassies in these countries are very large and convenient targets. Apart from what we've uh, uh, witnessed over the past uh, 10 days, two weeks, one could have started to make the argument that it was time to rethink uh, the footprint of the American government in the Middle East. In Cairo, for example, where I served as ambassador, until we opened our embassy in Baghdad, it was the largest embassy in the world. I had 2,200 people working for me in Cairo. Now, there may be reasons for that uh, historically. There are no reasons for that today. And it is time for us to rethink both how we deliver our assistance, which is the reason we had such a large presence, 
and whether or not we can do things with a much leaner and meaner presence uh, and not present such a large uh, and inviting target for those who are looking for uh, a, a way or a place uh, in which to uh, uh, vent their anger. Uh, so question number one in terms of what next. Uh, yes, we can expect more of the same over time, perhaps not immediately, but it certainly can recur. Number two, it will be a moment at some time for us to think about how we conduct our business in the region. I wouldn't suggest we do it today because it would look like cutting and running should we decide to downsize today. But the fact is that we are uh, overstaffed and we are uh, conducting our diplomacy and our interests in this region uh, in far too ample a manner. Third, as we uh, move into the post-Iraq and post-Afghanistan uh, world, it is also going to be time for the United States to rethink what it is that motivates us. What are our real interests in this region? We will always come back to the question of the Middle East peace process. Uh, those of you who have uh, been here in previous uh, sessions, you know that this has been uh, one of the issues that I have focused on a great deal. Uh, it has not gone away and it has not gone be gotten better and it will not get better of its own. So that's going to remain an American interest. Secondly, we have strategic interests. The supply of oil and gas, not necessarily only to us, but the free flow of energy outside of the Middle East is an American national interest, but maybe one that we can begin sharing more readily uh, the responsibility for the protection of energy uh, exports with other countries. We don't do that now. We largely do this unilaterally. It may be time to rethink uh, how we uh, play out this interest of the United States. So in other words, uh, keep your seatbelts fastened because we may have additional problems in this region, but also uh, put on your thinking caps because there will be uh, ample opportunity, uh, certainly after the election, for us to think uh, reasonably and rationally about what it is that motivates us in the Middle East, what interests drive us, and how we can play those out without being such an inviting target for those who seek one. Thank you. Oh, thank you all for coming, and, and it's nice to see some, some familiar faces out there. Um, I think the easiest thing for me to do would be, in, in many ways, to play off of, of Dan's uh, four points. And then I want to take a, a slightly different, um, uh, add, add one other point. Um, I'll say, first of all, my embassy in Yemen was not 2,200 people. Um, if that was his footprint, I had a toe print. Um, but I think that there is a legitimate question about how we present ourselves uh, in the Middle East. And some of it is, is sheer size. Uh, some of it is how our embassies are structured, um, what kind of a face we present to these societies, and also kind of how we conduct our diplomacy. But I want to I want to get to that last. On the what happened and why, I think Dan has given you a very good overview. Um, on the why, though, I think we do need to, without in any way excusing the violence and the uh, exploitation of events by those out in the region who would like to foment this kind of violence is to understand um, how events here in this country, even undertaken by our own very small minorities, can amplify out to the region. Uh, something that would barely make the page 23 of the New York Times under, you know, events in the nation. Um, play out in that region very widely, particularly this issue of disrespecting and dishonoring a religion. We are not the only ones who are targets of this. Uh, we, we tend to think that we tend to be slightly narcissistic and that everything is about us and everything is, is targeted on us. The Danes had the same problem when they had the cartoons. And Dan asked me if it was true, but I did get, uh, I saw an article this afternoon in the Slate uh, about a cartoon or some photographs in a French magazine that are highly disrespectful of the prophet. And the French have already decided to uh, wind down some of their embassies and pull out people. I think we do have to understand 
that uh, what we may see as satire, what we may see as free speech or political speech, um, doesn't necessarily feel that way to the guy on the other side. And I think in this particular case, at least with this film, um, it was not done as political satire. It was not done as freedom of speech. It was not done as freedom of religion. It was done in order to humiliate and therefore to incite. That, as I said, does not excuse the level of violence. It certainly does not excuse what happened in Libya. But we do need to be aware that what happens here has an effect out there. Um, the, excuse me, the connection with the Arab awakening. Um, I think this is a key point because in most of the, in the states where this happened first, in Tunisia, Libya, Cairo, uh, and Yemen, these are all states in transition where the government is not fully in control, as Dan explained. There is still a great debate going on as to what is going to be the nature of the societies, what is going to be the nature of the government. The security services, in many cases, are in disarray, uh, with chains of command very unclear. And so there you have, on one side, groups jockeying for position. And one of the ways that you try to burnish your credentials is to be more anti-American than the other guy. And then on the other side, the security services, which are charged under international law with providing protection, are not always organized fast enough in order to provide that protection. I do think it's important to note that, um, at least in Yemen, the security services did come to the rescue of the embassy. They did push back the demonstration, the demonstrators, and they did fulfill their responsibilities. But I think this period of transition, this, this lack of gelling of what is going to be society, government, and how the security services operate adds to this level of chaos. I am not in any way advocating for a return to police states um, or autocrats, but while they are working through this, this situation, they are not going to be able to respond as quickly as we would like. Um, what next? Yes, this will probably happen again, and if, if what I read about what's going to be in a French magazine um, is true, it's going to happen again rather soon. may not be directed at us, but it will happen. Until we learn how to actually talk and deal with each other um, with a little bit more respect on both sides, and I stress both sides, this is going to continue to happen. The issue of our footprint, though, I think is an important one, and I want to take it a slightly different way because, as I said, um, I did not have either the luxury or the burden of having 2,200 people in my embassy, um, is the question of how do, we, how do we protect our diplomats? How do we conduct diplomacy? Um, and this has been a debate that's been going on in the Foreign Service and the Department of State for at least 1982 with Beirut? So since about 1982, so 30 years. Um, and it has been accelerating over time. And the debate has always been, do you try to make us as perfectly safe as you can make us, which generally comes down to hermetically sealing us in our embassies, and God forbid we would actually talk to a foreigner. Um, or is diplomacy, as Edward R. Murrow described it many decades ago, the last three feet, the ability to have the personal contact? If our job as diplomats is to both project US policy, project US values, project um, the United States abroad, it is also to understand those countries and to understand them beyond just, the, just talking to government ministers. If my job as ambassador was to only spend my time talking to Ali Abdullah Saleh, um, I would not have lasted four years. Uh, it is talking more broadly in the government. It is talking below the ministers in the government. More importantly, it is talking with students. It is talking with business. It is getting out of the capitals. It is really understanding the dynamics in these countries, and you can't do that behind a 10-foot wall or a 15-foot wall. You can't do that if you are so secure that no one can get anywhere near you. And so the debate that we have going forward is how do you balance the legitimate need for security. We do not want to lose our people. And I don't know of a single ambassador who would ever consciously put any of their staff in harm's way. But how do you balance this need to get out, 
to be able to project and also to be able to understand with this need to be secure. And that is a debate that is going on. And I hope that as people are looking at the events, well, let me back up one. I think it's, it's telling that uh, the ambassador that we lost, that I have met but I didn't know, and I, I believe you knew him much better, um, was known for and has been properly honored for being out, for knowing the Libyan people, for understanding them, for helping them uh, get rid of Gaddafi. And that while we tend to focus on who was behind the, the horrific events in Benghazi, we sometimes forget that there were also Libyans who went in and tried to rescue him. There were Libyans who took him to the hospital, and there were Libyans who tried to defend the embassy. So we have to be very careful that we don't sort of revert to that very famous line after 9-11, which was, you know, why do they all hate us? And they don't. We have severe problems, they have severe security problems, but we need to not lose our ability to work effectively as diplomats on your behalf while we're just trying to keep ourselves very safe. And I hope that the retrenchment, we do need to right size, we do need to rethink, we probably need to restructure ourselves, but we cannot lose that ability to have those last three feet with the people that we're working with. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll take questions down at the microphones. As usual, um, two things. We preference students because we are here because of them. Um, though we do invite community members after the students have had their shot to come down. Um, please use the mics so we can hear you. And this is also being recorded, so it's important to use the mics. So I know you're thinking of your questions. Well, no one I'll, has had a single question so, on anything that's happened. My God, I think I'll I'll ask a question mm -hmm. <laughs> while you guys think. Um, I understand that this morning um, Ambassador Locke's car was also attacked in China, which of course yes. is outside of all this as well. And I wondered if this sort of tapped into what you were saying, and if if somehow what's happened in the last uh, week has sort of given people the idea that if you want to protest, you go to the embassy, or is this not a new thing? Well, this is I, just something that happens. I, you know, I, I, I can't pretend that I follow China nearly as, as closely as I should, but um, there have been some very uh, violent demonstrations in China um, over about the last period of time that have absolutely nothing to do with this. Uh, this goes back to, uh, this is a dispute between China and Japan um, and um, it goes back, you know, they have their own historical issues, their own set of grievances, uh, some provocations on the, from the Chinese point of view, uh, from the Japanese. I don't think that what happened to Ambassador Locke really has anything to do with this. I think it has more to do with these Chinese-Japanese tensions. Oh, no, no, I just, I just was wondering if sort of the idea of going after an ambassador and put our, 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 our embassies in more danger because of the last week than they were previously. No, no. I, don't, I don't think so. I don't, I don't know if they're in more danger, but I think you saw in the news the other day when they, there were these masses of Chinese marching uh, in Beijing and elsewhere, they were marching towards the Japanese embassy yeah. or Japanese restaurants. Uh, in other words, visible signs mm -hmm. of the quote-unquote enemy. Uh, so yeah, uh, the embassies present that kind of inviting uh, target. I'd only add, though, that China also has a, its own perceived Muslim issue with the, the, yeah. the Uyghurs. And uh, it may account for uh, something of Chinese uh, reticence, for example, to come down harder on events in Syria, just as the Russians have not yeah. wanted to come down harder. Yeah. And there may, this may be all tied up in that, but uh, it's not clear. I think it's important to point out that the US embassy and the Japanese embassy are either next to each other or across the street from each other in Beijing. So embassies are targets. This, unfortunately, is not entirely new. I mean, ambassadors, regrettably, this is a profession where you become more of a target as you become more senior. It's the reverse of the military. Um, you are the target. OK. Uh, hi, just a qu uh, the question uh, about like the timing of the entire of all this stuff. Uh, I remember like that when I first read about it, it was uh, not the anniversary, 11th anniversary of 9/11. That's when I read that the ambassador was uh, killed and everything. Uh, do you do you believe that uh, they ch that the uh, retribution for this video was chosen specifically as that day as a symbolic thing, or do you think was it possible that 
uh, Al Qaeda agents in Libya might have planned something for that day anyway, and just use this video as a perfect excuse? Or look, not being privy to what the American government knows and why it, uh, our government has been reticent to make that determination, it looks from the outside as though there is a connection uh, with 9/11. This this horrific video that was made by these folks who wanted to stir up trouble has been around for quite some time. And uh, it's not that it just came out two or three days earlier. Uh, plus the fact, as I mentioned, that uh, at least some, some small segment of the demonstrators came with enough heavy weapons to, to do the damage that they did. So I would not be surprised at all if in looking to do something on the anniversary of 9-11, they kind of took this film and waited until the moment when they could exploit it the most. But we don't know that. My, my understanding is that even though this, this calling a film may be giving it far too much uh, status, um, it came out in the spring or early summer, but it was only translated into Arabic uh, fairly recently. And there was, I think, something on Egyptian television. Uh, the three or four days before. Um, so that was, that was at least the initial. Um, the idea that Al-Qaeda had something that they would like to have done somewhere around 9-11 and that this provided a, a target of opportunity is, is possible, but I don't have any more information either. But the, the timeline of when the film became accessible to people in the region as opposed to available on YouTube was actually much closer to the, the dates of the actual demonstrations. Um, I also want, we're uh, broadcasting this in Bowl 16 downstairs, so if there are students in Bowl 16 and you'd like to ask some questions, you're welcome to come up to Dodds and do so. Uh, if in fact, why isn't the American public and the American government uh, enraged instead of kowtowing to we didn't this cut violence out. and death that seems to be approved by the region of society in which the Middle East is. Okay. And it doesn't mean that okay. the public and the government is just responding. It's like, no, I, you know, we're apologizing. That's what it seems no. to me. Well, I, I think if you go and you look at the record, we did not apologize. I think if you look at the statements by President Obama and Secretary Clinton, they very clearly condemned in the strongest terms what had happened. The idea that there was an apology, even the statement coming out of Embassy Cairo, which came out before the events in Benghazi, not after, uh, I don't think constitutes uh, an apology in any way. I think the, the government's been very strong. In terms of you know, everyone in the region supporting this, um, the Libyan government came out with a very strong statement condemning the, what had happened and expressing deep condolences for what had happened. The government in Yemen came out with an extremely strong statement, as well as helping protect our embassy. Um, and I think, you know, again, you have to look. We're talking about a few demonstrators, not the bulk of the populations. And in at least a number of the countries, you know, to the extent that they have been able to, the, you know, other elements of the population have also expressed their, their outrage at what happened and their condolences for our loss in Libya. So I think the characterization that we have had a weak response and that we have apologized is ahistorical. I, I would add, uh, I, I wrote a short piece earlier this week in which I, I took issue with three responses uh, that I think are all wrong. Number one are the accusers, those who say, well, all Muslims are bad and, and uh, uh, kind of lumps everybody in the, same, in the same boat. The second are the apologists, those who say, well, it's our fault. We're, we did something wrong. And the third are those who try to make political hay out of what happened. And unfortunately, this past week, all three have kind of popped their heads up. And they're all just wrong. This is a complex, uh, very challenging situation. Uh, what we did see uh, certainly was the effort on the part of some people within uh, parts of the Islamic community to foment uh, trouble. Were they using the United States as a means to advance their interests in their own country? Sure, yeah. no question about it. Are they also anti-American? Yes, probably so. But does that indict the whole society? No, it doesn't. So I think we have to be real careful about, um, even in, a, in a, our own homes as we're talking about this, uh, trying to avoid the same kind of overgeneralizations that we think others are too prone to uh, and uh, uh, try to look at this with a little bit more of the complexity that it deserves. 
Uh, you hinted an answer to my question in your last responses, but I'd like to ask it anyway. I would appreciate it if you would reflect in a little bit more detail about your take on the response of the Arab people and, and the Muslim people and the rest of the Muslim world, not just the governments, uh, but the people's uh, feelings and responses uh, to these incidents and how you would respond to those who, such as I understand in the Newsweek cover story, are trying to paint this as a very broad uh, indictment of the attitude of Muslims in general instead of small groups of um, uh, difficult uh, situations? Well, look, uh, I, I don't know what the overall attitude of Arab peoples are. As Ambassador Bozin suggested, we know in the case of the attack in Benghazi that a large crowd gathered uh, at the time of the assault on the consulate uh, and tried to rescue our ambassador when it still looked like it was possible to save him. Uh, we know uh, in uh, uh, places like Cairo and we heard in Yemen, there are large numbers of people who uh, abhor this kind of violence. Look, 50% of the Egyptian people did not vote for the Islamist candidates. So we think about the fact that the Islamists won, they won a very tight election, which means that uh, there's a contested uh, narrative that is underway in, in this society. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's hard, it's hard to project beyond anecdotal evidence, uh, but it, it goes back to the answer I just gave, which is I'd be very cautious about uh, overgeneralizations. I think anybody who, who makes those now uh, is doing so with very narrow political purposes in mind, and it's, it doesn't help us. Uh, if you're asked the question, ask the questioner the following. Are we all the pastor in Florida who mm. burns a Koran? And the answer is no, we're not. That's not who we are. And so we can't assume that all Egyptians, all Tunisians, all Yemenis are those who would take up violence against uh, the American embassy. Yeah, I, I would just echo that, that we, we do not wish to be judged by our fringe elements, and we have to be careful that we don't do the same to others. Is that mic working? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned just now, you know, how we're not all the pastor in Florida burning the Quran. My question is, how do we project that diversity of opinion? I've read a bit about cultural diplomacy and how we used to have open libraries and English language training and arts diplomacy, educational exchanges. So how do we, and, and perhaps that was too often aimed at an elite group of people, rather, or I'm not sure, but maybe, how, my question sort of is, where, what is the role of cultural diplomacy going forward? Is there a way we can phase that in into the what's next question? Um, you know, our embassies are like these and, you know, for good reason, they are huge and barricaded and it's hard to get into them. But I guess there was a time in a safer world when they were more open and there were libraries. I, I know personally that, you know, one of, this is kind of an aside, but one of the reasons why I was able to actually come to the U.S. was because my aunt was a librarian in the U.S. consulate. So how, you know, how can we use those cultural diplomatic means to I, I, change I think things. that's it's it's critically important and that's what I was I was talking about a little bit that um, we, we need to find a a reasonable prudent balance between security and our ability to do diplomacy um, there are some people who, who honestly seem to be trying to come up with uh, risk avoidance uh, there is no such thing as risk avoidance. Uh, and I just heard that one of our colleagues who spent decades in the Foreign Service just injured himself very badly by tripping on a fig. Um, you know, a fig? A fig. A fig. You know, one of those little fruit thingies that turns into a Newton. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a question of, of how you do risk management. And this is one of the challenges in, in embassies. Um, as the, I think the pendulum has swung very far to the risk avoidance camp. Uh, and one of the arguments that I was having when I was in Yemen is that they wanted to move my public affairs office, which is the cultural diplomacy, which is the library, which are the people who are most emphatically charged with reaching out to the population inside the embassy walls, which was absolutely counter to what their mission was. And 
trying to find, you know, how do you, how do you manage the risk so that we are still able to engage with students, so that we're still able to engage with the business community, so that we're still able to give visas to people, we're still able to do exchange programs. Is, that is diplomacy. Uh, you know, the, the, I, I've always had a little bit of trouble when we put an adjective in front of it as cultural diplomacy or public diplomacy, because it is diplomacy. Um, it, diplomacy is not just negotiating a treaty with a foreign government. Um, I think I did that sometime in my career, but it's a minor part. Um, and I think one of, you know, if, if there's a legacy from, from Chris Stevens, and I don't, I don't want to sort of turn him into, you know, an icon or something, but that's what he did. Um, and he did it very effectively, and the Libyans recognized it, and they recognized who he was and what he had tried to do. And I think that has to be one of the, the, the lessons going forward. Um, most people I know in, in the Foreign Service want to be out there. They want to have that interaction. Um, if, if, if the walls look forbidding to the people in the host government, you know, they are an enormous frustration to the diplomats because it's counter to who we think we are. But it's going to be this constant kind of balance and an understanding um, that we, we have to be very careful not to conflate a hostile event, which is what we have seen, uh, with a hostile environment, which is I, I do not think we have. But it's a real challenge. And I'm delighted that your aunt was uh, able to be your, your mentor to come here. Thank you. Um, we've got students over here, so I'm going to ask you guys to come to the front. I'm a student. Yeah, I know. So I'm good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I could tell. <laughs> um, I actually think that was a great question to lead into what, broadening it. Um, and my question is that it seems to me those last three feet are dwarfed by the scope of YouTube and the accessibility of international mm -hmm. media at this point. And that the best work of our diplomats on their best day, even with 2,200 people in an embassy, um, is really uh, over-resourced in competing with this message, or rather under uh, the, the scale of being able to reach into those cultures and into those populations is limited. So my question is, from a broader scope, do you see tools that we're not using that we should no. be? Well, look, we still have a lot to learn. The first Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy was a Madison Avenue ad executive. Mm. And it was kind of the exact wrong model, because this person came believing that if you could just repackage American policy in a way that would be attractive to other uh, peoples and governments, uh, we would be more popular. Uh, and the argument made by many at the time within the foreign policy establishment was you need product. Yeah. In other words, if you have a good product, the packaging will follow. So we've learned a lot. This is only the past uh, 17, 18 years. And I think we're still learning. I think the use of some of the technology tools is uh, useful and it's good, but it's not going to be a substitute for uh, pressing the flesh, for getting out and meeting people and having the uh, political and economic and public affairs officers out on the street and uh, getting to know those parts of the society that don't uh, uh, meet with the congressional delegations and don't meet with the Secretary of State. In other words, as Barbara suggested, it's the students and the uh, business community and uh, others, uh, workers and, and so society. forth, civil society. Uh, and there's, there's never going to be a substitute for that. If there's a, if there is a raison d'etre for having an embassy in a country, that's it. Because the technology today is such you could set up a Skype phone call between the President of the United States and any other leader in the world, and they could actually talk face to face. But that's not diplomacy. That's a, a, a senior conversation which ought to be carefully prepared against a backdrop of great understanding that would flow from this pressing of the flesh. So, you know, I, it, there's no, it, you asked for a, are there things that we're not exploiting or not doing? The answer is, I think, breaking down some of these physical barriers, getting more of our people out on the street, uh, talking to people. I, I had a situation, I'm now on the board of the American University in Cairo, and uh, we were there, my wife and I were there just a couple of months after the uprising, and some of our embassy officers had not really been outside the embassy uh, since the Tahrir, uh, largely because the security officer in the embassy was nervous about an American officer being on the street. 
And I think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's not that I want to put people in harm's way, but if they're not going to be utilized out on the street, then bring them home and shut the place down and tell people that you'll get your information from CNN and, and BBC right. and Al Jazeera. I will say that, that you know, the, all the, the new media, and it, it, the, it started, I think the first time we really had to deal with it and the question came up is when you started having 24-hour news cycles and CNN and then Al Jazeera and everything else. Um, I think in many ways what that did was actually accelerate the need for diplomacy because you needed to be there, you needed to have people who were known. Um, in a sense, if something shows up on YouTube, you want a public affairs officer, a cultural diplomacy officer, who can, in a sense, do her own YouTube to people in the country, and they know who she is, and they will, you know, watch her YouTube. But for her to be credible, uh, for people to watch the YouTube and, and, and say, oh yeah, I know her, and, and this is what she's saying, she has to have been there first. You know, first you gotta go to the campus, and then you can follow it up with YouTube. You can't do diplomacy, you know, from standoff. So it's, it's how do you take some of these new technologies, because you have to respond more quickly, um, but it's not a substitute for having been there and been credible and understand in the first place. Hi, I actually got back from Egypt and Tunisia a week and a half ago, so I barely missed it. Wow, yeah. so you should be up here then. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, glad. I'm sure my parents my are glad I'm back here. But, um, even though I could definitely see that anti-Americanism was definitely not pervasive in the region, um, what one thing that I definitely did see was that people my age were very tense, very, it, it was a lot of chaos mm -hmm. and just a lot of anger and frustration. Mm -hmm. um, something that's very easy to kind of, kind of you know, manipulate and yeah. funnel it around. Um, and I was wondering, and I was wondering at the time when I was there too, whether there are any programs that the embassies in the region, in Egypt or in Tunisia, um, or even Libya, are doing to engage people my age yes. um, that are being, you know, very easily channeled into easy venting frustration. Well, the venting and the frustration part, I'm not sure about. Um, <laughs> but this, this this goes back to what Dan and I have been talking about: is is that it is something that we used to do. It's something that we should be doing. Um, and if we don't do it, you know, we're not going to have these contacts with the rising generations in these, in these countries. Um, I think, you, you, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of the frustration is, is really at their own governments at this, the slow pace of transition, uh, the ambiguity of transition. Um, you know, we went through all this trouble to get rid of our government and everything didn't improve the next day. Um, one of the charms of, of a certain age group is, is, is a lack of patience. Uh, and, and this is good because it, 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 it pushes for change. Um, but then there's a frustration when things don't happen immediately. And, and a lot of the frustrations that were behind the Arab awakening, uh, the lack of jobs, the lack of economic opportunity, the um, paralyzed governmental structures are going to, in the best of circumstances, are going to take a while. We should be reaching out, and, and that's what we should be using, you know, junior officers for. Um, certainly when I was a junior officer, I spent as much time on college campuses, and I thought I was finished with that, um, because that's, that's who you want to have reaching out. Whether or not we're able to do it, whether or not our security officers are allowing it is, is one of the, the major debates and one of the frustrations that many of us have is that we can't do what we want to do. I would also point to, you remember about six, seven months ago, there was the so-called NGO crisis in, in Egypt where the government went after the foreign NGOs, uh, accusing them of interfering in domestic politics. Uh, a, a large number of programs that are funded by the US government or Congress are actually run outside the embassy by these non-governmental organizations. Some of them directed more at the political parties and political, uh, the growth of political uh, awareness, but some are obviously designed to uh, uh, be a magnet for the next generation uh, on the university campuses. Some of them work, some of them don't, but that's where the effort uh, sometimes is centered. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna take two more student questions and then we'll just open it up to who's in the queue, okay? So you came in, I think, from downstairs, right? Yeah, okay, and then we'll do green shirt and then we'll just get in line and do it that way. You'll be next. Um, 
You mentioned one of the strategic reasons for being in this area is uh, the Middle Eastern peace process. Um, and I, it seems like so much of the anti-Americanism in, in these regions have to do with Israel. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how much credibility we can have in these areas as long as the U.S. is seen to have a pro-Israel policy. That's here. Yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, a constant issue. Uh, you have a, a very significant divide in this country between those who make the argument that there is so-called linkage between what we do in the peace process and our relationship with Israel and how we're perceived in the Arab world. That's one uh, group. And then you have another group that says, no, it's, it's exactly backwards. If the Middle East were more democratic and uh, those d democracies were of a liberal nature, then uh, the Middle East peace process would, in a sense, resolve itself. Uh, and, you know, in a sense, you can pick and choose your spot. I have chosen. I think that our um, uh, policies on the peace process have not been as um, smart as uh, we, we should be. I think we can do better. We've proved in the past that we're able to do better, even given the nature of a strong relationship that we have with Israel. And we're going to have a strong relationship with Israel. That is a a part of our a political process and one that shouldn't change. But in the past, that has not been a, an inhibitor of a strong American role in advancing the peace process. Only in the last uh, 15 years or so has there been this idea that you can't do both. You can't have a, a relationship that helps protect Israel uh, against adversaries that still exist, while also helping Israel and the Arabs make peace and thereby resolving a, a, an underlying issue of great concern. So um, I, I, I come out very strongly on the side of those who argue uh, that we ought to be um, investing a tremendous amount of effort uh, now, uh, every day that we don't, I think we're losing, uh, in trying to advance the prospects for Middle East peace. I think we are a country that has shown in the past that we have the capability and the know-how to do it. We also have to have the will to do it, and that has not been evident in recent years. Should I should I do a plug for the uh, for what we're going to do? In... You can do plugs for whatever. Yeah. All right. In about two months, we're going to have a session here on two books that I've just finished on the Middle East peace process. One that I've they will be for sale. Yeah. <laughs> One that uh, co-authored that looks back at the past twenty years and tries to understand what happened and another, which is going to be a policy book coming out at the time of the presidential election, that suggests what I just said, which is a strong, robust, determined effort by the United States to advance the peace process. So stay tuned for that. I, I, and I, I want to add one, one point to this. I'm not going to get into the debate um, on, on I, I personally think that simultaneity is perfectly fine and, and reasonable. Um, but sort of almost taking the peace process a little bit aside. Um, I think that we, you know, one of the things that we can and should be doing and that, and that we haven't done as, as well in, in some, some past years is, is a fuller engagement with the Arab states on their own terms um, directly, not seeing the Arab world as a factor in the Arab-Israeli peace process. Um, in the case of Yemen, working with Yemen as Yemen on development, on the employment issues, the education issues, the health issues, and trying to help them create stable, preferably democratically tending um, states for their own sake. And if this builds a kind of Middle East which would either support, lead to, or subsequently support a peace process, that's wonderful. But there are reasons to be working with the Tunisians to uh, help them solve their economic problems and become sustainable states, to working with the Yemenis, working with the Gulf states to treat them as something other than U.S. military bases. And so I think some of it is, is dealing with the Arab states in their own right, per se. And if that creates a better Middle East for Israel, that's terrific. Um, but there are reasons to do it anyway. So almost immediately following uh, the attack in Libya, uh, President Obama ordered the deployment of warships uh, to the coast of to the Mediterranean coast of Libya. 
What do you think the significance of this is, and do you believe it was motivated by domestic politics in any way? What, what was the second? Uh, do you believe it was motivated by domestic politics at, at home here? Oh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know um, if it was connected to politics. I doubt it. Um, normally, uh, that, that kind of activity is undertaken when the president believes that there may have to be an evacuation uh, by sea uh, when other routes may not be available. And in, in uh, places and periods of uncertainty, uh, it's better to have your uh, ships prepositioned in case you do have to move uh, Marines and others uh, on shore in order to evacuate uh, not only the diplomatic personnel, but American citizens generally. I, I do not believe at all that it was a threatening act. I don't think there was any intention on the part of the United States to suggest that there was going to be some kind of military action undertaken. Okay. You in thinking through some, of, sorry, in thinking through some of the the two of the problems that you identified, one being the oversized embassies that we have in the Middle East, and one some oversized, some oversized embassies. <laughs> The other being the safety security of diplomats. I'm wondering how you think the dynamic of U.S. military engagement in the Middle East sort of interacts with this. And can you overreact and cede some ground to the U.S. military? Obviously, there's a huge presence both in Egypt uh, and there's a, there's a drone war, there's a shadow war going on in Yemen. So what, what's the right balance in State Department and Defense Department setting policy and showing the public face of the U.S. in the Middle East? Oh, um, I'll start on that one. Um, I, I think we do ourselves a disservice um, as, as a people in a country when our public face is the military, um, particularly in a country that we haven't invaded and are not at war yet with yet, uh, like Yemen. Uh, I hope the yet is a very, I hope it's a never. Um, it, it does tend to skew the, 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 the view of what our interest is. Are we, in, in the case of Yemen, for example, I, I personally do think that our policy has become far too militarized, far too security centric, um, to the exclusion of others. Um, and one, I guess one dimensional is, is the issue. And that what this, this says in, in some countries um, is that we're not really here for Yemen. We're not trying to help you become truly stable, to become sustainable, to become a, a functioning state. We're here for kind of a proxy war. Uh, and uh, this does not win us a lot of friends. It does, not, it does not give that sense that we are engaged with them directly. And I don't think it's in our own best interest. Um, the, the, I've seen this also in the Gulf where we have mil you know, very large military establishments in all, I think, you know, all of the Gulf states. It may have made sense when we were fighting a war in Iraq. Uh, it may be necessary as we wind down in Afghanistan. But one of the questions going forward with the Gulf states is that post-Iraq and post-Afghanistan, is there really a reason for us to have such a large military presence? Um, or should we, it's not a question of diplomacy or the military, but of getting them in much better balance, um, of projecting economic relations, diplomatic relations, cultural relations, all these other elements of engagement with other societies as well as other governments, and getting it away from what can look like an overly militarized um, and one-dimensional kind of, 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 of uh, relationship. One of, the, one of the basic truths is the Defense Department and the military has just a whole lot more money than state does, always has. It's got a whole lot more people. Um, when I was working in Iraq, I had some people, some army people who, you know, why doesn't the State Department send all of its people to Iraq? Because this is the most important thing that we're doing. And I said, do you have any idea what that means in terms of numbers? You know, if we stripped every FSO out of every embassy in the world, you know, what, we get 7,000 people? Um, you know, for the U.S. Army, that's, you know, their paperclip um, budget. Or it's actually the number of people in the Army band and all sorts of other things. Um, so we, we need to 
And this goes back to what Dan was saying, is that we need to kind of redefine what are our long-term interests, what are our long-term goals, and how do you best both project those, and how do you best uh, implement them. And I don't think that our military and our military face is, is the best way to go about that. Um, and I don't think it's, it's healthy in, in a lot of these countries. Hi, um, I have a question about the actual attack on, in Libya. Maybe you can clarify something. Um, it strikes me, I mean, it's a question of whether it was planned or spontaneous. But the problem is that what happened took place at a council in Benghazi, and at, at a time when the ambassador was there. Mm -hmm. And it's to best of my knowledge that there were no demonstration or attacks on the um, embassy in Tripoli. Um, so I was wondering if anyone well, wants to comment. Well, this is why, I, again, I, uh, our government has not yet made a determination, but it just seems to me that there's enough, um, there are enough pieces of evidence to suggest here that this was uh, a far more organized effort by a small group of people. Now, Chris Stevens' presence in Benghazi was well known. He was going there to inaugurate a program at a hospital. And part of the objective of inaugurating that program was that it be public, that people see the health assistance that the United States was providing. So this was not a secret trip. This was not something kept under wraps. Uh, but I, I think you've added another piece yeah. of, the, of, the, of the puzzle, mm -hmm. and it does suggest that, uh, uh, as I believe, that at least a small group of people uh, chose the time, the place, the circumstances uh, in order to do this, and then exploited this larger issue of um, uh, honor of religion, uh, or dishonor of religion, to uh, marshal a larger a mass of, uh, of supporters. But I, I think Benghazi, as opposed to everywhere else, uh, looks very much like a concerted attack on, on our ambassador. Um, I just wanted to know, um, as far as what we've been hearing from that region um, since the Arab awakening, as far as um, this population feeling the need to be dignified and heard by not just their own governments, but by the world. How do you kind of balance the dichotomy between dignifying the Arab sentiment behind, for example, this film or what was happening, and at the same time not apologizing or validating mm. the violence? Well, I, you, you've defined the, the question that, that is now motivating uh, all of our diplomatic representatives. Um, as I said right at the, at the top of my, my formal remarks today, that I, I ask that nothing that I say today uh, in any way be seen as justifying or uh, expressing understanding for the violence. On the other hand, um, to not try to understand it and to not try to um, look at ourselves and say, are there things that we can do better in terms of communications, in terms of cultural sensitivity, uh, it would be foolish not to do that. So you, you're constantly in this balancing act between uh, condemning in outright um, categorical terms those who would take up violence against us, and on the other hand, trying to understand, at least on the part of those who may be swept along emotionally, what is it that prompts the, that emotional trigger to be, um, uh, to be used or to be exploited in situations? Uh, now, you know, we, we know, for example, uh, that in most of the Arab world, uh, media uh, for a long time were controlled by the government. Uh, to do a film, even a cruddy film like this, you needed a permit, and you needed a license, and you had to go through censorship. Now, if you're born into that society and that's what you know, do you then expect that it's different in the United States, where anybody with a, you know, a, a few dollars can go into Best Buy and buy the machinery and put out a film, and now you have access to the internet, and the next thing you know, there's a thing out there called a film. Now, if you're in a society where that can't exist, 
or didn't exist for a long time, it may be hard to understand that in other societies, we don't even know that it's happening. You know, Sheila and I spend, we're watching television and it, it bothers us a great deal when even our own broadcasters say, the American film. Yeah. It's not an American film. It happened to have been made on American soil, but it was made by hate-mongering people who wanted something to happen that happened. Okay, but it's not an American film. But it's, it, that's part of the, what we've been talking about all day. How do you bridge these um, language and cultural and um, emotional differences and not be an apologist for uh, what's going on, but also not being an accuser? You have to figure out a way to, to get through to people. And as Barbara and I have been suggesting, it's, it's dialogue and communications and, and hitting the street all the time and talking to as many people as possible. When we were in Cairo uh, both times, we were actually stationed there twice, the joke that we had between us was that we tried to treat every Egyptian as a potential, and we did it with quotes, voter. In other words, if we wanted to try to bring about the support of, of Egyptians, how would we go about doing it? So you say hello to people on the street, and you say thank you, and you treat every individual with respect, and it's not done in a lot of places. The, the doormen in Cairo were surprised that we would actually recognize that they were human beings. They were, that's their job, but nobody ever said thank you to them. So I'm not suggesting we were doing it right, but it's the idea of trying to find mechanisms to um, reach beyond the formal diplomacy and uh, interact uh, personally and in a human way with other people. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. As usual, you know, I can't get to everybody. Um, Lena? Is Lena? Okay. Why don't we do stripes? Stripes win. <laughs> I was, it was my turn, I think. Oh. Yeah, but you're not wearing stripes. Yeah. But you're not wearing stripes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Um, so we've seen in the past that when there is civil war that plagues a nation, it allows for extremists to come in and try to rise up in that nation. And we're seeing that kind of in Libya. And I mean, I know that America has, at least in this case, tried to give countries like Libya, like Tunisia, the ability to um, take ownership mm -hmm. of the revolutions and take ownership of building their new state. But would it be worth it for the U.S. in this case to help out at least Libya to go forward with state building to avoid the like um, rise of extremists in the nation? Or is it something that we should leave to the Libyans themselves? Mm. Uh, Great, thanks. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I chose the stripes. <laughs> I know I did. I know I did. Um, and she's already got her final grade, so I can't get her on that. Um, I think there is there there's something in between that. You know, there's that it's not a question of of us taking ownership of the state building and the nation building in a place like Libya, or kind of doing nothing and letting them just kind of figure it out on their own. Um, it's, in, it's a question of how do you work with them, of letting, letting them lead uh, with guidance and, and technical assistance, and this goes to what Dan was talking about, the NGOs that we often work through. Um, but being there to assist, uh, to provide the education, the guidance, the training, whatever it is that is needed for state building and party building and civil society building, in many ways, is they're defining it, of, of letting the priorities and sometimes the sequencing be advised but not shaped by us. Um, so that, you know, you're not, and this is one of the, I think, the concerns that, that many people had after the big events of the awakening, you know, Ben Ali leaves, Mubarak leaves, Gaddafi's dead, Salah leaves, that it's over. Um, and that you know everything's been taken care of. Um, we need to stay engaged, but we need to stay engaged in a way that allows them to maintain the ownership of where they're going. And I think that's, that's entirely possible. Um, and I, my understanding is that's what we are trying to do in Libya. Um, I know it is what we are trying to do in, in Yemen, and, and I will presume in other countries. I'd only add, one of the things that, one of the, the motivators that I try to use for myself overseas was not to teach so much as it was to share. 
Uh, mm -hmm. For example, in Cairo, uh, we invited an American, retired American professor who, before he had become a professor, had uh, marched in the civil rights movement. And he gave a series of lectures. My objective was not to teach Egyptians about civil rights. It was to help them understand that it took us a long time till we started to figure out what we needed to do to fix our own problems. And I wanted them to understand that we were not uh, trying to define for them what they needed to do so much as to, have, to help them thinking, uh, think through the issues that they were going to confront. And uh, so, you know, there's, it, 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 when you ask the question, should we stand back? The answer is no. I mean, we do have things that we can help others learn. But I think we have to be very careful about assuming that um, we can walk in and teach uh, given the fact that we also have a checkered history on a lot of different issues. But some of that checkered history becomes lessons that others might assimilate as they go through some of the same uh, challenges. Okay, well, I want to thank everyone for their patience. We